Set to go. I will start the recording. Recording. Very good. Uh, thank you. Great. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. It's great to have you here today uh, in this mid-July day. I hope you're having a wonderful time. Sometimes getting to have a little bit of holiday time or some kind of refreshment, vacations and things like that. So great to have you on the call today. And let's begin with prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you praise and thanksgiving for the gift of a beautiful day. And we give you thanks, especially for your presence with us, for the ministry and mission that you entrust to us, for the leaders of our parishes, wardens, treasurers, and clergy, for the work that they do, for which we give hearty thanks, and for your strengthening presence that draws us all together in the unity of the body of your son, the church, and the world, and together with those who, who minister with us, both near and far ask you to be present with us this afternoon as we gather for our call and we discuss the next steps as we move through these unprecedented times. But especially we pause for a moment today to give thanks for the life of Art Hewer. We pray for Sharon, his wife. We pray for the people in the parishes of Wellington and Milford and also at St. Mary Magdalene's in Picton where Art had been ministering in his role as treasurer there. But we also give thanks for his ministry in the wider diocese over the years, both within our diocese and in other places as well. May you strengthen his family and uphold them in this time. We also give thanks for the upcoming ordination of Georgina Stewart to the priesthood. We pray for Georgina and her family. We pray for those among whom she ministers in Sydenham. And we give thanks for your call to her to answer the call to priestly ministry. I ask you to be with us now in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, folks, so we're going to follow a little bit the similar pattern. I, I, again, don't have a lot to, to share with you today other than, as I said in the prayer, to express my thanks and appreciation for uh, the work that you're doing and continue to do. Uh, we, we uh, moving through our guidelines and, and protocol responses through the co these COVID times and the work that you're doing with that. Again, we continue to see in the province of Ontario, right across the whole province and in our area, that the numbers are very, very good. And we hope that they keep that way. We certainly uh, continue to hold in our prayers our brothers and sisters south of the border, where uh, the, the curves are swinging upward and the second wave is really getting going there now in many places. And you see how devastating that can be. Um, tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of cases that are happening there. So, so we give thanks for the diligence and the care that people have been taking in all aspects of our society to make, excuse me, to make sure that that doesn't happen here. Uh, so we continue on from there. So what we'll do is uh, flip it over to, uh, to Wayne, who's going to talk a little bit about the, the guidelines and where we're at right now uh, moving forward. And then Alec will give you the, take it from there with a the financial update. But most important today, again, is the question and answers and comments that you have and bring to the meeting today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Wayne. Thank you, Bishop. Friends, it's good being with you this afternoon and thank you for giving your time. I just want to briefly address our pastoral ministry and worship guidelines as they align with the civil provinces moving to stage three of reopening effective today. Part of that reopening suggests a larger number of people may safely gather. We are monitoring that and will continue to do so. But the gist for us is that the guidelines that were made effective June 29th are those valid for the Diocese of Ontario and our parishes that we're building toward moving to the amber stage, God willing, in September. We're making preparation for that to assist you and more information will be coming, but that the existing guidelines are those that are in effect. If you have any questions uh, about particular situations in this regard, please feel free to contact the Bishop or Alec or me and make use of the pandemic email in the days and weeks to come, and we will be happy to do our best to respond. But again, I just want to reiterate that the guidelines made effective June 29th are those that are applicable in our diocese and its parish. Thank you so much. Alec, over to you. Thanks, Wayne. 
So uh, just a, a few bits from, from my office's perspective. So I know everybody's been waiting as well to hear on, on the Canadian emergency wage subsidy. So we had to chase the last couple, but um, we now have all of our reporting units, churches, and in some cases, uh, parishes, uh, and we have all of that data in. So comparing June 2020 with June 2019, across the diocese, income in our churches was down $151,000 in total. That represents 32.7% of what June 2019 was, which means that we do qualify for what is referred to as period four, um, which, which is the month of June. So sorry, it's period three. Um, and so that will then automatically qualify us for period four, which is the month of July. So we're now uh, working through the actual submission. Um, Joyce has uh, um, put, put that together. The actual um, amount we'll be receiving is, is $150,000 in change. Uh, so basically the amount of the wage subsidy will pretty much match across the diocese what, uh, what, what the uh, reduced income was. Of course, that's not necessarily um, distributed evenly, but, but that is uh, we will receive that amount. The once we receive the funds, those will be applied to the July payroll invoices. And why it says April, I guess my fingers got a little carried away because that that should say July statements, not April. Um, so the the June subsidy will appear on the July statement, and then the July subsidy, which we now know we will qualify for, will be applied to the August payroll statements. And August payroll invoices, and therefore will appear on the August statements. We are still going to collect the month of July information in early August. And the reason for that is that if July um, is over 30%, uh, then we would, uh, we would then automatically qualify for August regardless. So we will continue to collect them each month. The federal government has announced that as they are um, stepping back from the CERB program, which is focused on individuals, they are focused on um, the support coming from this wage subsidy program, which is, of course, available to the employer side. So they've ex announced that they intend to extend that out to the end of 2020. And they are also considering changes to the qualifications. As I mentioned last week, we don't know what that's going to look like yet, um, but they have indicated that they are looking at it. As we get more information, both from what uh, we receive directly, as well as what our legal counsel on the employment side and our, our financial advisor, our, our audit firm provide, um, we will continue to update. But basically, we will be, be running that sheet that we've all been filling out now each month for the rest of the year. Um, that will give us, hopefully, as we go forward, our incomes won't, won't be uh, down, but we're gonna continue to collect it, to understand it, and to be able to also, if we do meet, an, or if they alter the thresholds, that we can take full advantage of the programs. So as I mentioned, that will be uh, coming on your um, July statements. Uh, driven by the July invoices. So Wayne mentioned around the, the guidelines are, are, are continuing in place. Uh, we are in the red stage. We'll continue here till early September at the earliest. If all goes well, uh, we will in, in September look to, um, to, to reopen our churches um, both from a ministry and a, and a worship perspective. We all, uh, we, you know, summer vacations, people coming and going on vacation. So as we mentioned last week, uh, today's meeting will be the last one we'll hold until somewhere around the 21st or 28th of August. And obviously those, those meetings will be focused 
on planning um, around the, the planning and the guidelines for reopening in September. And as Wayne mentioned, the pandemic, if, if there's again with people coming and going on vacation, um, sending something into the pandemic email, you're always sure that someone will get it. And again, as always, if circumstances change, which, which you know, as this has been very fluid, and as the bishop mentioned, what we've seen in the United States, we all uh, hope, pray, and work for not um, going into that kind of space. But if circumstances change between now and and our next call, we will of course quickly put a call together and communicate that out. So not a whole lot of other prepared material for today. Um, as as we mentioned last week, we are. I think the financial pieces are fairly consistent, and uh, we'll be looking now as to as we work through planning for reopening and monitoring in terms of what's happening in a lot of other places for best practices. So with that, we will turn back from the Bishop Wayne and I over to all of you. Um, as always, for for Q and A, you can ask a question. Um, Speak up and ask a question. Make sure you're off mute, of course. I ask you to stay on mute if you're if you're not asking a question, to, to minimize background noise. Or you can use the text function. Uh, Laura is online, and uh, Laura will be um, moderating and asking any questions that come in over the chat line. So over to you all. I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Pauline. Um, oops. Um, not sure if it was just me. Did anybody else hear the question? No. I have a question. I thought you mentioned someone else's name. Oh, sorry. Anyway, okay, so the question is, given that um, our next meeting is at the end of August and things are going to change in September, how much time can you predict we'll have to switch over to whatever the AMBER guidelines will offer us? So the, the target at the moment, um, along with several other dioceses, is September 13th. If if we can get there for the first services, if we can get there earlier, we will. But that's that's the target we're working at now. So our hope is that that by rolling those out, you're going to have you know three weeks or so to be able to to work those through. Let's let's be honest. The am the the amber guidelines um, are going to be um, very much related to what the reds have been in terms of areas like um, sanitation. And, uh, and and social distancing and those things. Uh, but we are working, in fact, with uh, the other dioceses around best practices. We're working and it will work an internal group, but we're trying to work across the province to pick up best practices. And so again, that should be, we're, we're targeting middle of August for first pieces of that. Good, okay, thank you. Good afternoon, it's Robin Jones. Hi, Robin. Please don't kill the messenger. Sure. All right. Um, could we uh, have a little bit more uh, of the thinking why we are delaying going to Amber until middle of September? Um, I, I, I know in, in our parish, there have been um, many people who are happy that the church has not reopened, but there is some some consternation on uh, on the issue. And so I, I'm fairly, fairly well informed, uh, of course, on, on what's happening in relation to the government and, and stage three. I need more. <laughs> um, and please don't kill the messenger. I just want to be able to deliver your message, Bishop, on why we are not opening at this point in time when the government has opened everything else up. Thank you. I can see the bishop moving, but he's not. He's on mute. Uh, he's 
he's on mute. He muted himself and then talked into thin air. The, the um, uh, yeah, it's a very good question, Robin. And uh, and I knew this would be an issue as we get to a point. As long as we're walking lockstep with the civil province, it's not that big an issue. The moment the moves start happening, they begin to open up, and kind of the pressure that's been on the province to do that, do the stage reopening there. Uh, related to what we're doing in the ecclesiastical province and what and the decisions that we're mirroring here in the diocese of Ontario, I'll give you my perspective for for what it's worth. It is uh, when I look at what what the province is doing, they're looking at the totality of the demographic that they're dealing with. They're looking at the economy that that, that needs to be restarted. They're, they're looking at a whole series of issues. When I look at the diocese of Ontario, I look at a population the majority of whom sit in that in those high risk categories for whom returning to church uh, has a certain degree of of risk and concern and I hear that articulated and I and I would have to admit that I share that as well and that's been an issue that has come up a number of times in the conversations I'll let Alex speak to what the executive officers have have spoken about, but I know uh, in in the bishops' conversations this has come up a number of times because of the various things that I talked about when we talked about COVID and and how easily it can reassert itself. And uh, and I and I I've said all along, and I and I hope my consistent message has been that if I'm going to make a mistake, I'm going to make a mistake on the side of extreme caution. And so I looked at it and I said, okay, we're mid July, we're heading towards September, we got six weeks. And six or seven years from now, we're not gonna wonder whether it was six weeks or six months or six days, but I know there's a great anxiousness to try to find some kind of new normal that we're moving into. And, uh, and as the province takes their advice and I think has been, has been moving in a very reasonable way, they take a much broader look at, at the demographics they're dealing with, the economic issues, the health issues, the proper balancing, the acceptance of risk. And, and I look at that from a diocesan perspective and I primarily it's the demographic that I look at that we're dealing with. And uh, you know, as we're, as we're moving through that related to uh, the, the, the financial issues that Alec had pointed on that we're, we're, we're also taking a close look at, at those kinds of things and doing the things that we're making the decisions that we're taking right now. So that, I mean, without getting too much further into it, I would say that would be where I would come down on over these. And I, and I would encourage that we continue. And I understand, fully understand the, the, the frustration with this. People want to get back into, into, their, into the church buildings. They want to get back, start moving towards some kind of normal. We're doing so well in the province of Ontario. The numbers are going so well. And it's because of, uh, of the work that the municipalities yeah. have done. The medical officers of health have been outstanding. I mean, just in, in terms of how they have, they have dealt with this, but it takes all of the partners within society to continue to be vigilant and, uh, and, and, and look at their own particular context and how they want to move, move forward. So one of the things, uh, uh, what was it St. Paul says, all things are possible for me, but not all things are helpful. And and it, and it is possible for us, but uh, just at this stage, I, I I would encourage continued patience and vigilance, and we will get there. We will get there. These days will pass. But it's a very good question, Robin, and and I don't I doubt I would even want to singe the messenger, let alone do anything worse than that. So anyway, thank you for the question. Unless Alec, you have something you want to add from the executive officer's perspective. My question too, Alec, I think. Are they going to continue to meet weekly over the course of the summer, uh, or is that? Yeah, yes, okay. we are. We are continuing. One of the one of the things that that we've targeted to try and do is create as much commonality on practice as we can. And while each church is unique, um, there's obviously there's much much in common. One of the things that um, and we've picked up on what the Archdiocese of Toronto has done, and some and there's going to be a video created that will try and give people um, some help in terms of what to expect when they come to church. Because coming to church when we reopen is going to be quite different than what it was before. Uh, because you now have to think about, you know, how just people coming into the church, you know, you can't sort of have four people coming through um, a hallway or a bell tower 
alcove um, all at once. It's, it, there's got to be that distancing. There needs to be um, virtually a sign in so that there is tracing available um, should there be any issues. Uh, the Chancellor of Toronto has has uh, determined that that must be kept for three years. Um, and so that information has to be gathered and collected. You have to work out though how you sign in when of course I can't use a pen. And then if Wayne's right behind me, Wayne picks that pen up because of course that would allow for, for transmission uh, as we go. So there's a, a ton of details like that, how the seating is going to look, uh, how um, we're gonna handle communion and, and, and again, all of those types of things need to be need to be worked through, but we also need to be people to be prepared in terms of what to expect, so they're not coming in and sort of just being hit. So that's one of the things that that is one of the work projects we're trying to work across all seven dioceses. Is a video on, on how this will work. Will be videos and best practices on on cleaning and sanitation, how to handle, how to actually simply measure out how many people can can go in your church. It, while the, the province has announced 30% of your capacity, that's subject, that's a maximum, but it's subject to there being that six foot distance between people. And, and so now you think of, I like to think of it as a six foot two by four that you can stand and, and spin around without hitting anyone, other than someone who is inside your bubble who could be right beside you. Uh, so there's there's all of those kinds of things that we now need to, to 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 work, but also people need to what to expect, and so that's that's work that and and this video that we're looking to produce is being produced for so it's a good quality piece of work, um, and we'll then use that as a as a reintroduction for folks coming back in. But we are continuing to meet each week through the summer, and uh, we never seem to run out of things to talk about. Alex, there's a question on the chat. Where do we stand regarding the use of masks when on church property? Are the expectations different for the volunteers and staff and parishioners and clients? Are, or are they expected, sorry, are they expected to provide masks for those without? Is the answer a hard and fast answer or up to the individual sites and circumstance? So, so the, a church is considered a public building. Um, and so just like when you enter into a, a business or you enter a, a lawyer's office, an accounting office, anything like that. I mean, I went in, I had my tires um, replaced this week. You know, in, in I go with a mask on just to, and to be able to sit. So the, the expectation is that masks are, are used unless you're alone in the building. Um, but when there's anybody else, that is, that is the best practice. And in most cases, that is the law. Um, best practice again is to be is to have masks on hand, particularly where we're we're being hospitable to people coming in. So there are masks available for those that may not be regular to the building. Any other any other questions? This is Al Teal. Uh, Alex? Yep. Can you hear me? We can. Going Al. back to the signing, going back into the signing, signing and how that would work. Every church has a parish list of their parishers. And all you have to do is make up a parish list and attend or not attend. And then you can only have one person do the checkoff. Yep. And that as they come in the door. That is what we're looking at right now as best practice is simply yes. you, know, you already know who your people are. We have to be prepared when there's um, visitors or you know people that aren't aren't regular to the church to be hospitable. But yeah, absolutely, that is the, the simplest way. And, and you already have their contact data. So it's not a, um, um, it's not something that's, uh, that, that's kind of out, out of the piece. 
but that is going to be one of our our key pieces around um, again maintaining that that if there is an issue that occurs and we pray that there isn't that um, that in you know, that in those cases there is contact data so they can do tracing. That's the main reason we're doing that for tracing. Yes. Yeah. If Thank there you. is if there is any kind of issue that they're able to and it and that's where things like we I think we've all heard of bins nails here in Kingston, um, but but part of that was is uh, um, being they they had the data to be able to trace people. Just by um, one of the things, and I've I've shared this in, in a, with, with a few people, but just to give you a feel, I mean, when you think about, and I know this is this is not this is in a, in a larger parish church in England, um, and it's in a church that doesn't have pews; it has it has chairs, but it kind of gives you an idea of what 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 it's going to be like as as we as we return to our churches. The, the kind of distancing you'll see there. There's two people seated together that are obviously in, inside their own with their own bubble. Everyone else is is six six feet apart. Kind of just reminds us what we're going to need to be able and and have to be working on as we go forward. So in in these bubbles, uh, say of ten people. If 10 people are in a bubble and they come into church and you've got pews, can those 10 people sit within two pews? Yeah, those people can all sit within six feet of each other, but that bubble would need to be six feet away from anyone else. Okay, thank you. And again, that's going to mean that there needs to be, you know, just trying to follow things through in the church. Being a sides person now is... Uh, is a little bit more complicated and are there are you know what what the role of a sides person is there's a whole series of questions that starts to come with that but um that's the some of the things and then it's not just the guidelines what we're trying to get at is what the best practices will look like alex does that also mean that four bubbles of eight come in you're at your fire capacity potentially if if you're let's say allowed 100 again this is the, the complexity of some of this but if your fire capacity is 100 and you're allowed 30 percent and you had four bubbles of eight come in you've now gone over the the cap so it's a little bit if you recall your algebra from from school it's you know if and then statements so if there's less than this then so that is part of what the challenge will be and and how we work those things through. Alex, I have another question. Sure. Um, the whole idea of sanitizing after people have been in a church or a hall and the infinite number of surfaces that may have been touched it's, it was suggested at a meeting the other day that um, some folks are looking at using um, us either aerosol sprays or spraying tools and spraying whole areas with uh, sanitizer just to sort of expedite the process. I wonder if anyone has gone that path or has ideas. Um, I'm not fond of aerosol cans or sprays you know, spraying large areas with anything in particular, but I, I wouldn't mind some feedback on that. Or if you can take that to your group for your further discussions, that would be great. It, it is part of the discussion. I mean, one of the things that I think we've, we've, I've mentioned before, people don't quite grasp sometimes is, you know, you think when you spray something on and then you wipe it off um, and it's clean. But most of the disinfectants and the cleaners that are used require anywhere from three minutes to 10 minutes of contact. So that would say that if you're using, um, you know, a, a disinfecting spray, uh, that you need to let it sit for, depending on what the bottle, you know, it'll, it'll tell you on the bottle, but it could be anywhere three to 10 minutes. And then you need to go back and if you want to wipe it off, because of course I'm, you know, I, one of the things that somebody is looking at from another diocese is 
how do we handle brass? Because I, and I know for all those that are altar guild and those that have, have worked with the altar pieces, you know, brass O is kind of standard O uh, for use O. And, it, and brass O is good <laughs> for cleaning in terms of, but if you spray liquid onto brass and let it sit for 10 minutes, you're going to get spotting. And and how do you handle um, how do you handle the, the the you know things like the, the 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 lectern if someone touches it we're having discussions around how do you it's not good practice to spray a microphone at least not onto the head of it um, and so there's there's all those pieces that are being worked through to be able to say yep that's what but if you watch on TV and you see them. Um, in businesses and public spaces sanitizing, what you end up seeing is, is people in full suits, with masks on and the big spray things that they, they, are, they are working through. We're, we're hoping that, that again, by, by practic practicing this and being careful that we don't have to be that extreme. Uh, and again, use patterns are another thing because the virus is only, depending on what you listen to, 24 to to 48 hours, dependent on the surface and how porous it is. If, if your church isn't used again for another week, right? And certain, you know, the pews in those areas are less of a risk. So there's, there's a number of things that have to be. I think the, the important thing to remind everybody, you cannot eliminate risk. This is a question. Thank you. Trying to manage risk and trying to minimize risk, and what we are obviously all working towards is that we want the safest environment we possibly can to eliminate risk. Alex George Vail, can I say something? Sure. My understanding is that this uh, COVID-19 is a virus, not not really a bacteria. Thing virus right. so i think what you have to be careful when you buy any of this spray or any of these wipes that it's a wipe that will kill virus plus the bacteria some of these uh sanitizers and wipes it'll say on it it's only good for germs and bacteria it doesn't say it's good for viruses so i think we have to be due diligent and make sure that we get one that will not only kill germs man, but it'll also kill a virus and and that is so we are you know again looking to put Practical. I mean, it's one thing to recommend stuff, but it's not much good if you can't find it. So, what one of the things we will be looking to do is provide, from based upon the health unit and the the province of health ministry of health guidelines, what effective cleaners are, what you should be looking for, and then then where you can find them. Yeah, because I know now you. Uh, I see some of the stores like the WalMarts and that now are or it got sanitizers out there where before you couldn't get any, but then now there's, uh, my sister-in-law was telling me she was in a Walmart in Kempo today and they had who gads of it, but it was was only uh, good for germs, it wasn't good for viruses. So that, that's something that if, any, if anybody's buying it for themselves or if they use it at the church, they're gonna have to make sure it's a, it kills a virus as well as a germ. And, and I think as, as I understand it, George, the general guidance is the alcohol content, because most hand sanitizers are alcohol-based, it needs to be at least 60%. And I know that some of the, the ones that have been produced by some of my favorite breweries and distilleries, that when, when this hit, they, they started making sanitizer. Some of those are up north of 70%. So, you know, one, and again, there's different issues with that, that level of it. So. Yep, we there need you need to be mindful that cleaning is is, is is using the right space. And again, having it on on the surface long enough, because I don't know about you, but when I clean, and I and I'm not well known for my my attentiveness, is you know, you you spray and then you wipe it off. And and as I said, you that you need to have a different practice to that. Yeah, yeah, all that you're you're absolutely right. Thanks for that information, Alex. Do you have any other, Laura? Do we have any other questions on the 
on chat? Yes, there are two more. Um, one of them is someone is looking to locate the info for the funding for the tech support. Can you explain where they can find that, please? And that is on the on the diocesan hub. Uh, any anything that we put out is on the diocesan website under the COVID hub. And uh, and so that everything there goes goes uh, goes up forms like the forms we just did for for for, for the Sue's pieces, the forms for the, uh, the 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 monthly revenue pieces, updated guidelines. Each one of these calls, both the charts and the recording, goes up on the website. So this is the 17th um, such gathering, uh, and they're, they're all up there, both the charts that we presented and the, the, the recording, the video recording. Following up on that, Trish Miller has sent a link to our website where you can find that application. So thank you, Trish. Thank you, Trish. And, the chat. and the following question is, in an effort to be proactive, a church has ordered separate cups. Will the communion guidelines be in the AMBER documents? The communion guidelines will be in the AMBER document. However, and I'll, and I'll, I'll look to the bishop, but I, I believe that during the AMBER mm. phase, uh, there is no that, that we will we will be using um, only in one cup. Bread. We will not be using the bread. it'll be bread only and, and until we get to the green stage. And there's lots of discussion there about how one distributes communion. So, and and there there may be several options there as well. Any other? Laura, anything else on the? No, that's everything in the chat. Okay, well, as as I think we've all mentioned, you know, the if you've got questions, the pandemic line, um, if you use the, the that email, pandemic at ontario.anglican.ca, um, that is monitored, that will get um, to someone who can answer your question. Um, the Bishop and Wayne are both on vacation in the month of August. Um, the, um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking some time the end of July, but, but one of the three of us is, is, is always available. Um, and the, the rest as other than vacations, everybody's in the office is still working from home. So we will, uh, we will endeavor to answer questions or concerns as we go. I will get make sure there is, is lots of notice for the next call. Um, and we may well, as as things get start to form out, if things become clear, start to send some things out a little earlier. And you can keep an eye on the hub for that. So Bishop, I think we're ready to turn back. Okay. Great. And, and again, thank you very much and, and have a wonderful a wonderful rest of the month of July and into August. Uh, one of the things that, again, I, I, I consider these calls one of the silver linings in those COVID clouds. It's just absolutely wonderful to meet with all the leaders of the diocese once a week. And, uh, you know, uh, one of these things that we need to continue with information, maybe not a weekly thing when this is all over, but certainly a regular thing, because I, I've, I've found it extremely helpful uh, from, from my perspective. So, again, thank you very much, and we'll close our We'll close our meeting off with the grace. With the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Take care, everyone. Bye bye, and have a great, great July. Bye bye. Barbara George signing out. Have a great vacation, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dale.